He can do anything, yeah. Cause he got the power, God's got the power. He's got the power, he got it in his hand. He's got the power, God's got the power. He's got the power, oh my God. He can do anything, oh yeah. My God, he can do anything, oh my God, my God, yes he can, he can do anything, yeah, my God, yes he can, he can do anything, oh yeah. Cause he's got the power, God's got the power. He's got the power, got it all right in his hand. He's got the power, God's got the power. He's got the power, oh my God. He can do anything, oh yeah. My God, he can do anything. I tell you, he healed the sick, yeah. Oh, yeah, and then he raised the dead. Oh, and 5,000 hungry souls he fed. I tell you, he can Make a way out of the way. He can turn your darkness into day. My God, he can do anything. Oh, yeah. My God, he can do anything. Listen, it Make no difference, oh no, what the problem, oh I tell you, my God is able, yes he is able to solve them, he can make a way out of no way, he can turn your darkness in today, my God, he can do anything, oh yeah. My God, he can do anything, oh my God, my God, yes he can, he can do anything, yes he can. My God, yes he can, he can do anything, cause he's got the power, God's got the power, he's got the power, he got it all right in his hand, he's got the power, God's got the power, he's got the power, Don't you believe that he can do 
telling you, my God, uh, he can do anything. Because I tell you, uh, he's got the power. God has got it. He's got the power. Yes, he does. He's got the power. Yes, he does. My God has got the power in his hand. My God, he can do anything. He's got the power. Yeah, he's got the power. Nothing is impossible without Christ. You have to have Christ. Amen. Amen. Anything too hard for the Lord. That's it. That's it. Thank you, honey. Question is, is anything too hard for the Lord? He hasn't run up on anything yet. And, uh, he can't handle it. So, beloved, you have your Bibles, which you join me today. Once again, we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 23, uh, only to lift up a verse. And then. We'll go back to Exodus, Exodus chapter 13, as we continue our series, Warnings and Woes, and today we're here in Matthew chapter 23, we're going to lift up verse 5, and then our teaching from Exodus 13 around verse 8. If you're able to stand, we'll get right to it. Matthew 23, verse 5. But all their works they do for to be seen of men, they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to stand here where my Lord would stand. This was 2,000 years removed and he was here in the body which you prepared for him. So we approach this hour with the sacredness that we require. We ask now that you would take what you have written Speak to us by the Spirit. Help us to look out for the pitfalls that are in the world and even within Christian. We ask your blessing over our time as we teach and part talk from your word in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. We observe from the scriptures the origin, the meaning, the significance and purpose of the seen practice that our Lord Jesus Christ saw amongst the Pharisees and the scribes. We're not interested in what those self-righteous men paraded themselves around with doing, but we are concerned with the origin of wearing a pouch on one's forehead containing scriptures and on their hand or arm to see where its origin came from. And we, we briefly saw it last time when I was before you, but it has its origin and God delivering his people with a strong hand out of Egyptian slavery. 
That's the origin to it. So to see these men making it a religious fashion show is, is rather disgusting. That was a lot that the Lord God did to bring his people out. So the, the origin of this practice was based on the Lord and him revealing his arm to bring them out of slavery. The meaning, it was redemption. He redeemed his people by blood. It has salvation in view where he would bring them into freedom, but this freedom would require them being free to be with him. See, that's freedom. That's salvation. Salvation is being redeemed by the blood to be saved, to be free to live, but to live for God and in Christ by God. The significance for us, we touched on it, here in Exodus 13, the same day that they came out of Egyptian bondage, the Lord instituted two of the feasts, actually it's seven total, but we, we, we do have two that's mentioned here, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the significance, not only to them, but to us, is that Christ was, and still is, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. So, so he's the one who gave his life a ransom for many, the implications were far reaching them in type, but for us it's the reality. That, that's why we are here, is because of him, the Lamb of God, Amen. which was authenticated by God the Father. Now, what does that have to do once again with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That was something that the Lord instructed them to do when they were in Egypt, that they would cook their bread and haste. There couldn't be any leaven in it, any yeast, no yeast. Any yeast in this context speaks of sin. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread speaks of the one who has come as the Lamb of God to take the sins synonymous with yeast and bread but our sins away that was the significance unfortunately once again it had become a religious fashion show for these leaders As far as the purpose, the purpose, and we can turn now our attention to verse 8 of Exodus 13. And thou shalt show thy son in that day when you're in the land, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me. <coughs> When I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be for a sign unto thee. Upon thine hand. And for a memorial. Between thine eyes. The purpose is that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. The sign is just another reminder of not you and your feebleness, because you were a slave. Slaves can't necessarily deliver themselves. And in this case, they couldn't. 
but it was the Lord with a mighty hand. And these ordinances would serve as a memorial that you don't forget that. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. Look over at verse 16. And it shall be for a token upon thine hand. Once again, that's just another way of saying sign. And for frontless between thine eyes. For by strength of hand, the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. So, so this is what the pouch on the forehead that was worn, which there's some discussion as to did the Lord really mean for them to walk around with this stuff on them? Or did he really want them to have the word hid in their hearts that they might not sin against them? I do know this much, is that the crowd that Christ called out put his finger right on the pulse of their spirituality and say that they were dead still in their trespasses and sins all it was was an outward show. But this has its origin and meaning and significance and purpose in God delivering his people and for his people to know God's word. It was sad if you're looking through the, the eyes of Messiah to see people who had been given the word of God, who did not know the word of God. Their leaders prided themselves in them knowing it enough to read it, memorize it, cite it on demand. But the people were the ones who suffered the most. So as we transition to, well, how is this word supposed to be in our mouth? When we're talking about signs and memorials, we're talking about tokens to the hand and a memorial, you know, frontless before the eyes. The word of God has to be taught. And I might just pause and say today's lesson, because this is what it is, is Teach my people the truth. And when I hear the Lord saying from his word, my people, obey the truth. Is that too much for him to ask, Dennis, of you? Or is that too much for him to ask of you, beloved? When your full purpose in order to glorify God was to obey his voice no matter the cost, no matter the outcome. You heard me say this, and, and I've fallen on my own sword since then. Oh my goodness, how many times? Many times. He said, when we choose to sin knowing what God's righteous standard is, we're really choosing to die. Because the soul that sinned, it must die. And as Pastor was teaching that this morning, that's why we have this complex that we're dealing with with our flesh. In this old world, being in the shape that it's in, one sin put us in this situation. So whenever you choose to sin, whether it's by omission, just, I'm not going to do it. What God's will is. Or I'm going to go beyond the righteous standard of God that is a clear, it's just a clear line. Matter of fact, it's more than lines. It's the word. 
we're saying that in that moment, I'd rather, I'd rather just, for what I want to do, I'll die in order to do it. Isn't that something when you think about it? That's what happened to our foreparents. That's what happened to Adam. Adam knew when he ate that he was going to die. The last time that, beloved, you considered sinning against a thrice holy God who alone is good, did you let him know by saying it? No, we don't do that. But what we do is our actions say, Lord, rather than walk lockstep in fellowship and communion with you, I'd rather die getting to what it is I want to do. I want to have my way. I want to say what's on my mind. I want to get this thing straight even though I know this is not the time for it. And the Lord has already told me he's going to work it out. But Lord, I want to do it and I'm going to do it. What am I saying to him? It's saying, I in that moment, it's worthy for me to die. Yeah. Those of you who went ahead to Deuteronomy, Chapter 6 from our last study in verse 1. Remember, we'll hear this a few more times. Is the Lord is not entrusting his people to a man, or even let's include Aaron. And even the other men who came alongside Moses, <clears throat> Joshua and Caleb, for them to do with his people and his word as they see fit. See, there was no way God could teach his people, lead his people with leaders who put themselves in front of God to usurp authority over the written word of God. And verse number one. Now these are the commandments. Commandments come from one who is, without announcing it, a commander. It is God Almighty. And what comes from him are orders. My son knows something about this, and, and as a family, we have grown to appreciate the military and those who serve to protect us that's a part of the first responders because of what could have happened to him. So if you've been in the Army, you, you, you understand that you, you take orders from someone who is above you with rank. But in this case, the commandments are orders from the commander. No, no, not suggestions. Not for us to kind of kick the can down the road like we typically do when it comes to the will of God. His statutes. His statutes are permanent, unchanging. Think of in a, something that's been engraved. But God is the one who has engraved it where his statutes, they're not going to change. These are God's unchanging standards. And then his judgment speaks of the fact that there must be a judge who has already made decisions before actions actually have taken place. So, according to Romans 7 and 12, the law is holy. And the commandments are holy. And just and good. So, we find no fault and cannot find any fault in what God's people received as the nation Israel. And nor can we find any fault with what was given to us by Christ to the apostles.
Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgment, which the Lord, your God, commanded to teach you. So what we have here in verse 1, we have the curriculum. This is the doctrine for these people whom God's going to bring through this land like upon the wings of an eagle. There is a sovereign command to Moses. Look, look back at the text. Which the Lord your God commanded to teach you. Who's going to do the teaching? Moses is responsible for the teaching. We can't make too much of this. We, you know, we're not going to press it beyond, you know, the realm of in scripture, but Moses was a prophet, he was a shepherd, and but Moses was a teacher. Usually this is lost. The Moses in whom we look up to in scripture, the people he led, the greater portion, looked down upon him. He was not a man of God. Even though he had been authenticated, and they knew of a surety that the Lord was with him, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 2. And around the B portion it says, Moses was faithful in all the house of God. Was he perfect? No. But he was faithful. And I want to spend a little bit of time dealing with, with Moses. When Moses got out of his character, and he allowed the people to bring him out of his comfort zone. He came out of his skin, so to speak. Those folk, the folk got to him. And it involved having some drinking water. I find this amazing. The people in this instant became angry with Moses because they didn't have any water to drink. But then I was reminded of when the Lord brought them out of Egypt and he led them to the Red Sea where there was more than enough water to drink. Matter of fact, that was too much water. What did the Lord do with too much water? He told Moses what to do. He gave him instructions as to take his rod and stretch his hand. And the water that was too much for them, they passed over dry shaw. But when they get to Exodus 17, in verses 1 through 7, the Lord had led them, I believe, to a place where, once again, there was no water. And rather for them to take their experience with the journey with the Lord and being led by the man of God to say, Moses, we're here. And I, I want to say it's those rough at them. It's where they were. Moses, we, we're a little dusty, man, but, but we, we know the Lord going to come through. We remember what he did down there in Egypt land. We can't forget and we'll not forget how we went over dry shot when there was too much water. We don't have no water. Moses, we are a little dusty. But no, they didn't do that. These folk rolled on Moses. And Aaron, so much so, they went up one side down the other, where Moses said to the Lord, these people are going to kill me. That's what Moses believed, that the people of God, whom God had invested at that time, all that he had to give to them to bring them up out of Egypt land. Lord told Moses, I want you to take your rod. Go gather the elders. Gather the congregation together. Yes, the whole congregation. I'm going to go.
go and stand on the rock in Horeb. Get the picture. Moses know that the Lord is going to stand on the rock. What you do, Moses, is this. I want you to strike the rock. And water is going to gush from the rock to the people. They will be refreshed and they'll have plenty to give their family and livestock. Well, Moses did exactly what the Lord said. And that's what happened. You would think. You would think. And when you get to Numbers chapter 20 and verses 1 through 13, the Lord led them once again to the same situation. They come up on a place where there was no water. What are they supposed to do? Well, faith ought to come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But also, there can be faith also when the word of God is made alive. This word is alive. It lives. But the experience, their thirst caused them once again to rail on Moses. They became contentious with him and Aaron. Oh, man, they blasted them because you brought the Lord's people out here. You should have left us in Egypt. We didn't want to come out here. Look out here. What's out here? Moses and Aaron, they went to the door of the tabernacle and fell in the presence of the Lord, and the Lord, his glory showed up. Once again, I'll just tell you what to do. I want you to take the rod that you have in your hand. Gather the people together. And there was a rock. See, <laughs> wait a minute. Wouldn't you think that someone would have said, back in Exodus 17, verses 1 through 7, you remember what Moses did? Moses struck the rock. And there was some discussion that the Lord was going to be standing on it. And we drank, we drank, man, we drank to our bellies hurt. We drank, that was the best water. <laughs> you thought that when they seen a rock at their destination, you got to remember that the Lord, is, he's the one who's leading them. Not the rebellion that's in their heart, but he's leading them meticulously. And he's leading them to the place where he wants them. And that rock, I grant you, that was there, and it was a literal rock that was there. Come on, Moses. You're not going to do this for a few. You're not going to do this for many. He's going to do it for all. I want all. Gather everyone. Here are your instructions, Moses. You to speak to the rock. You speak to the rock, water will gush out, sufficient to cover all of the people's needs and their livestock. And when you read what Moses said, it doesn't even sound like Moses. Moses called them rebels. Ye rebels, should we fetch water for you? It's not Moses. But Moses fed up. In the moment. But Moses loved God's people. And God's people knew that Moses loved them. And God knew that he loved them because on a few occasions, he interceded for them when the Lord would say, I'm willing to just wipe them out and start over with you. Moses and I moment of disobedience. Rather than speak to the rock. Because see, that's what he'd been doing with who? The Lord. And come on, let's just go on and cut to the chase. But the, the Lord in the context here is none other than the one who is Christ. Moses 
Moses took his rod and struck the rock twice. Water came out. People are jubilant. Everything is fine from man's viewpoint. But the Lord was angry. And he made it known to Moses because of your, your unbelief. It was, it was a, as almost a, a moment of temporary insanity. Your doubt. And yes, whatever he was feeling in himself. The Lord told him. He said, you're not going to go into the promised land. And, and when, I, when I came to that again, and I was thinking, well, probably Moses didn't want to go. Yes, he wanted to go. He didn't want to go into Egypt until he went into Egypt. And God's program started to unfold. And his presence was manifested with him and before him. Moses did not have to do this alone. And he had Aaron, you know, that was there with him. He had a, a familiar face. He had someone that he knew. He had family with him. But to think that Moses didn't want to go into the promised land. And what I found to be extraordinary about this man, Moses, who would shepherd these people, who would teach these people, is that he could have done like some of us do, pout. I'm done. I'm finished. I'd rather die than live. I'm, 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 I'm through. I'm done. Bye. See y'all. I'm catching the night flight out to heaven. Glory to God. But Moses continued with God's plan. He was faithful in all of God's house. How long? Till the end. You know what the Lord rewarded him with? Moses went up into, he was there in Moab, and he went up into the mountain there in Pisgah, and the Lord showed him the promised land. I'm going to let you see it. Look that way. That's what, who's going to be living that way, and this is who's going to live over here. And I'm going to let you see it. And you don't know something? I wasn't there. And I'm not going to put any words in that situation, but I believe Moses was said probably something similar to what Peter said on the day when Moses and, and Elijah appeared with Christ up on the Mount of Transfiguration. To see what the people were going to inherit, he could say something like this, Lord, it is good for me to be here. I can't go in, but I know they're going to get in. Moses is not going to keep them out. And he finished. See, that's the thing that makes Moses an extraordinary teacher, no matter how things got while he was leading God's people. And these were some rebels, man. They hated Moses. They despised him. And Joshua wasn't a whit behind him because according to a passage in, I believe, Numbers, that they wanted to kill him too at one point in time. I'll be honest with you. We as God's people, and I'm talking about, let me say it this way. That the remnant is one thing. But the people, because it's hard to tell who's who. But those folk, they were just hard, hearted, stiff necked, uncircumcised in heart. And they saw the will of God as being arduous. In other words, this is more than we can do. What do you mean? This is more than you can do? Come out of slavery? Go into the wilderness and get them shackles and that slave mentality dealt with so you can go into the promised land and you can take my promises with you into the land so you know how to live in the land. Well, what's hard about receiving the, the promises and these folk, their promises, unlike to the church and God blesses us along the way. But remember, we are in Christ. This world was not his own. So how he dealt with them was more through physical blessings with us, our blessings are spiritual, but they're in Christ. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how 
that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. Now, the rock wasn't falling. Not, not a rock like the rock of Gibraltar. Not a rock <coughs> that's formed from the sediment or the, the rocks from the ground. This, the rock was the one who's the rock of ages. Clef for me. He's the one whom Daniel said, well, my son, he was a stone cut out of the mountain without hands. He was on a roll, too. He's the king. He's the king of kings. He's the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. Be honor and glory forever. So it wasn't the rock that followed them as far as being a, a, a natural, physical rock. It was a spiritual rock, and that rock was Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through Four. It was Christ. Christ was with them. Christ was with them, but with us, he's with us, but we're in him, if you say. Christ was back there. Oh, we get to talk about it's the Lord, it's you know, Yahweh and you know and God. Oh, yeah, but the one who was with them, the one who was on the ground, was the one who formed Adam from the dust of the ground. He was the one who, by revelation, continues to just reveal himself. He's the self-existing one who revealed. So As we turn the curve to close, I want you to join me in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Moses was faithful in all of God's house all the way the end. What is that? What are they? What's the application to the church? I said this in a few messages ago. What the church needs is just we need teaching. We are preaching. It, it serves its purpose. But we need where the word of God is read and then explained. Without any condiments. In other words, without any mustard and ketchup and, you know, being clever to be a show off, but to feed the flock of God by the Spirit of God. The application to the church we have here in. Chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, and this is the Apostle Paul speaking to Timothy. Notice what he says. As pastor, teacher, you have to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In God's unmerited favor. In God's love that's being meted out to you in your life and ministry, you have to be strong in grace. That is in Christ Jesus. Notice verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me. Now these are going to be the things that the apostle Peter wrote about, which are scripture. And they are in the word of God to us. You've heard these things among many witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men. Remember, Moses was faithful in all of God's house as a teacher, shepherd, as he was a deliverer, he was a prophet, knowing that it was the Lord who did the heavy lifting and delivering. 
And as long as Moses obeyed the will of God, who was teaching God's people? It was the Lord teaching them. The curriculum was his. It's holy. It's just. It's good. So now we've got to get this word in the hand. What the Apostle Paul is saying to this young pastor, you've got to get this word in the hand of a man or men who are going to be faithful. The entire church ought to have heard him preach and teach the word of God before they lay hands on him to send him out as a representative. The whole church should hear every God called man to hear him so that there's a unanimous of a surety. This man was called to not only preach the gospel because he has to preach the gospel, but he has to teach the word of God. Not a cultural, social message, but a message that gets down to the brass tacks, down to where the rubber meets, down to where the nitty gritty is when it comes to scripture. Don't think that I haven't been a little, little nervous when Pastor Trey came forward. Even though he preached and you heard him preach the gospel. But is he going to continue to be faithful? So what did we do? Unbeknown to him, and I guess he could find out if he was watching the monitor, we would drop in on him when he was somewhere else ministering the word of God, and we heard him doing what we had come to know and what we were being blessed by. I mean, I know y'all being blessed because he's going to be away for a while, and y'all made that known today, and that's what I want to hear. I don't want folks talking about, well, hmm, good riddance. Glad he gone. Are you sure you can't stay another week or two? <laughs> No, but it's not that way. If you've come to appreciate because he's been showing himself to be faithful. And I mean, he goes at length to be faithful. Amen. Amen. So what the Apostle Paul is telling Timothy that he's telling us, the church, is that the whole church must hear this man or these men before they are commissioned to go out. I'm telling you the truth. I'm, I'm just letting you know. That's, that's, the, that's, that's the environment or the environment of this text is that that man, he has to be demonstrated faithful when it comes to handling the word of God. It must be committed, thou. That's another way of saying that the Holy Scriptures need to be committed to a faithful man. I've said this and I'll say it again. Is that I'm not so much concerned about what translation. I know God has preserved his word. I mean, his truth will endure to every generation. I'm concerned with getting a faithful man with the word of God and then you straight. Moses has become like a template for us until we saw Christ come. And he's, you know, he's the standard. Let's just go on and get that out and put it here right now. Because the word, teaching the word, going to teach the word. The word, preaching the gospel, going to preach the word. But a man who's faithful when it comes to the Holy Scriptures, he doesn't care about what people think, feel, desire when it comes to who he's going to please. And this is the most important part of the, the leg of the scripture. This is the other leg. Who shall be able to teach others also? In other words, when you come into a setting like this, you ought to have, one, some life work. So I, got, I still got some life work to do. Okay? Lord, I got homework also. Homework I got to do in the house. I got life work to do. I'm not out of the woods because I'm still in the world. I haven't made it. I have not arrived yet. So when you're under a teacher, someone whom God has anointed, the Spirit of God is speaking truth. I mean truth to life, truth to power. Rather than 
what I know Paul didn't have in mind is for pastors to come up with a bunch of books and read something out of this one about this man, this man, and this man. Oh, we quote a man here and there. But let me tell you something. Paul had in mind committing the word of God to faithful men that he might teach. Teach. Apt to teach in another place. That he's able to teach. A pastor must be able to teach. I mean, he ought to be able to preach too, but he must be able to, he ought to be able to take the word of God, just the word of God, and teach it from study, from preparation, from the leading and guiding of the Spirit, listening for the Spirit of God to speak while he's speaking. One of the things you all have grown to accept around these parts is that I don't ask you all for no amen. It's rare when I say amen. Uh, Actually, for one, or oh, can I get a witness? I'd have to be really, you know, it's a rare moment for me to do because I want to hear the Spirit of God speak to me in the moment. And I'm going to tell you this before we let you go is that in these last evil and wicked days, you want to be under pastors who are going to take the Word of God, they're going to rightly divide it, they're going to cut it straight, they're going to be like the pharmacist, they're going to give you your prescription. But it's from God. It's not from them. And what I, I'm just going to level with you. Right now the world, right now the world is getting this house in order. They calling it the new world order. I shared this with someone on last evening. The new world order is to take, well, what can we do with the sins that we were doing? Can we just, just take them and just go Stretch them. Let's just go wickedness upon evil and debauchery. That's the new world order. It will contain that. Well, beloved, you have to understand something. Judgment is going to begin at God's house. We're talking about Christ coming, going to get us and take us away. No, we're going to be around for some judgment. He's going to deal with us. And he's going to allow, I've said this before. He's going to allow the world to actually inspect us because in the final analysis, we are going to judge the world and angels. Yeah. What they've done to us, we're going to get to do, and Christ will be the primary judge, but we'll be with him. And I'd rather be with him judging the world and angels than being the world being judged by Christ. Now, you can choose who you want to. So during this season, the church is unprepared for persecution. We, we, what we want to do, we want to go out on the first load. Yeah, we're waiting for the rapture. Oh, we can't, we want to rapture out here. Rapture where? Where are you going? You mean to tell me that work you've done is worth you leaving and going into the presence of the Lord now? Is there more land to divide? Is there more opportunities to take advantage of? Escape what? Escape what? I don't want to go until my work is done. Preferably when he comes back. I like to go with him that way. But I don't want to go how shabby this thing has been for me. Haven't didn't start well. Hadn't gone well. Man, I gotta what? I gotta what? Finish well. I got some kin folk in here too. You gotta finish well. You know how you started? You know how it's been? You know where you are, and you know, listen, I got to do a whole lot. And Lord, I ain't trying to impress you. You just tell me what I need to do. That's what Moses did. And this is the admonition that we're receiving from the Apostle Paul. That he used to commit the Holy Scriptures. What they had heard concerning him among many witnesses. And also the other Scriptures. You committed to faithful men who are able to teach and tell you the truth. Let us pray. Our Father and strong God, we thank you for this opportunity to come actually before your presence, the audience of one, and along with these precious souls, Lord, here as witnesses and hearing what you have had to say to all of us. Lord, I'm just delighted for the privilege and honor to, to teach this congregation and for you to actually go out amongst the airwaves to others who Lord, have an opportunity to do something with this word. That we reveal ourselves in such a way that when you do come back, 
that we will be looking for you to come because you will be healing for our eyes. We'll be looking, not in our laziness and how we're trifling with that, but we'll be looking for you because of the persecution and because of what we're doing to get the gospel out and to feed the church and to live the life. Father, I'm praying for those who under the sound of my voice who don't know you and the pardon of their sins. Those also out there in social media land that they know they're not saved, they know they're not right with God, just church children. I'm praying, Holy Father, that you convict them. To let them know that they must repent of their sins. They must repent of their sins. They must repent of their sins to the point where they are finished with sin in their mind in that moment that they might be able to trust you. They have faith toward God from Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you save the soul that's nearest to hell right now. Save them, Lord, as only you are able to do. We give you praise in Christ Jesus' name.